Good afternoon. I was going to say I'm, I'm really not worthy of the, the company I'm in uh, today, you know, given the, some of the very profound topics that have been discussed through the day, but I'm, I'm absolutely not worthy of the introduction that Misha's just given me. But uh, I, I thank him nevertheless, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be, be here with him and all of you. Um, what I wanted to, to share in, in some thoughts with, this, with, with this, this, this audience is some sort of experience that I've had over the last few years of trying to match architecture to architecture, and I'll explain what I mean in a minute. So it is about radio architectures and network architectures, but it's also about the actual people that end up using these networks and the places that they use them in, and, and the difficulty of making those things fit. Um, just to explain the context that I'm coming into this discussion, my firm, Real Wireless, is an advisory firm. You can say consultants, but we, we find in Europe people spit on the ground after saying the word consultant often, so we like to say advisor. Uh, in the States, it's completely different. They all want consultants. Here, they, they want advisors, so we'll stick with that. But, but what we do, we're a group of, of electronic engineers, certainly, but civil engineers, structural engineers, economists, people with a good background in industry, that are trying to make wireless work better for, for real organizations and real people. And, and sure, we work in the industry with operators and vendors and regulators on, on figuring out how well the technology works or doesn't. But, but really what we're about is building a bridge between the wireless industry and wireless users. So, so for example, colleagues of mine, whenever there's a football game at Wembley Stadium, they are there making sure that everything works nicely. And it's us they come to if the the fire, police, ambulance systems interfere with the broadcast systems, which in turn you know, have some impact on the cellular systems there. And we try and figure that out from a very practical point of view. Um, and what we're about doing is trying to find a way that the aspirations that some of these venues have for wireless can actually get realized. So they'd usually come to us with a, a thing like, we're gonna be the world's leading stadium in connectivity, the best connected stadium in the world. And then we ask them, well, what, what does that mean? And they, there's, there's no second sentence to that aspiration. So we help them translate that into, well, what does that mean in terms of a network? What technologies need to go there? What relationships do you need with operators to, to realize those aspirations? And help them understand that just building a Wi-Fi network probably isn't the answer. And you'd be surprised how many users out there translate wireless into an enterprise Wi-Fi solution. And th I think that's the end of it. So, so it, it's born of that. Now, as Misha said, said uh, you know, I've, I've had a sort of fascination with the in-building part of wireless, mostly because I spend most of my time inside buildings, uh, and trying to think progressively about how we realize users' expectations and not disappoint them, which fits with what Martin was just saying. Now, apologies for stealing um, from the European Commission's point of view on 5G here. There's a lot of exciting stuff happening in 5G. A really big challenge for us is we're excited about 5G too, and, and I sense an excitement from this group of people around 5G. 5G for our user communities is a real double-edged sword for us though. Mostly what 5G means, if they've heard about it, because the Mayor of London says we'll have some 5G one day, is should I wait then? Because 5G is coming, so let me not do anything today until 5G comes. So mostly we have to tell them, if you've heard anything about 5G, please forget it. But, but that gap is closing, and it's closing remarkably quickly. And we're trying to figure out how to make, make 5G genuinely useful to that audience of people that we deal with. Um, now, down here, the Commission says 5G is about communication, storage, and processing, and that might resonate with some of us. But I think, actually, it really isn't. It's about people and places, or, or it needs to be about people and places if it's going to actually deliver some kind of value at the end of the day. Um, and some of the, the beautiful mapping that I've seen today really tells us, you know, have, has networks, tell us not about networks, but about what people do and where they do it. And I, and I think that's, you know, that's a fascinating story. So let's think back. If we want to make networks work well for people and places, let's see what the starting point is, because we can't ignore that investment that's gone on over the last 30 years or even longer. Well, this is what we built mobile networks to do, right? Car phones in cars on roads for voice. And you know, we can all chuckle about that and say, well, yes, we remember that, but we're in a different world today. But I know radio planners who know intimately the cell sites that they built back then to serve that traffic. And we carry that legacy forwards with us of networks that are still in those places. 
it's evolved, but it hasn't evolved as fast as all that. You know, and what we what we what we view is that is that you know civil engineering moves forward much more slowly than than the clever you know information theoretic engineering that, that sits behind there. So we still have this legacy of a traditional view of you know really big cells, and 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 for the avoidance of doubt, this is not going to be a an anti macro cell discussion for one moment, but it's an understanding of how do we make the networks actually fit the needs that are there. And, and I th again, you know, I, I think I was fascinated by the, the mapping discussion. It was about getting three-dimensional about the world. And I, and I think, again, you know, recognizing the real world that we live in, that three-dimensional world, we need network architectures to fit with the real world people live in. So, of course, we're going to have pictures like this. You know, we know it's about devices. We know it's about growth. Martin tweeted earlier on that it was compulsory to have a, an up and to the right growth curve. So I've put it in there, especially for you, Martin, to prove that point. But, but my interest in, in this is not actually so much the quantity, but the nature of place and, and all the, the time that we spend inside, the time that we spend inside buildings or in places that are, are very special. So actually, this is what I mean by architecture. Yeah, real architecture. Um, this is where we live. We live in these cities, we live in, in these houses, we live in these stadiums. And, and when we look out across a city and we see that diversity of buildings, we don't say, oh, what we need to find is the right building, the right shape of building for everybody to live in and do everything in. No, that diversity of buildings is reflective of what we do in those places and the history we've brought with us. So if we're going to have a network architecture that that fits with the needs of people, it needs to be at least as diverse as this. So the idea that we solve everything with stuff that looks like this and try and force fit it to stuff that looks like this and where we are just doesn't work. Or at least it will work, but it will disappoint, and, and that's often the case. So, so what, what I really appeal for is a, a toolbox, a grab bag of different options for spectrum, for cells, for technology over the air, for core networks, that we can shape to fit those needs. That will keep us busy as a company, talking to these people in these buildings, and it will keep all of you busy because they'll be happier. You know, they'll, they'll get what they're actually hoping for. So, so what we really want to see is a kind of transition from this old world. Now, we, we've done a lot of work with regulators, and I don't want to single out Ofcom, but, but you know, you'll, you'll get the clue that we've worked with them a fair bit. They were very excitable about coverage because they, they'd, they'd published some maps of coverage that allegedly said 99 point something percent, um, and they'd imposed some coverage obligations. So they had a sense that, that you know, coverage was nearly done. There was a little bit of inbuilding coverage to deal with, so could we have a little look at the extent of that? But basically, with you know, it's it's you know a little bit of unfinished business, uh, and we looked at that and thought about actually. So the, the gentleman from Ericsson earlier on was was talking about a building being covered from the outside in, and 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 that's absolutely you know outside in is always going to win if you've already built the sites out there. That's going to be an economically sensible thing to do. But we actually looked at the incidence of the metalized windows and at the regulations that are now placed on buildings when you build them, and they're getting more restrictive. And we translated that into, well, how many buildings is that going to impact, and how many people are going to be happy? And then you think about the fact that, that the, the rates they, they need to be happy with mobile broadband go up over time. You know, their, their minimum expectation increases. And then you look at the devices that we use, which are considerably less sensitive than they used to be, you put all those factors together, and despite the fact that you're, us you're using sub-gigahertz spectrum, despite the fact that you're building more sites, uh, you know, despite the fact that we have more efficient technologies, the in-building coverage still gets worse over time, the number of places that people are happy with their service. So, so there is something to be done. And part of that is trying to figure out how we make the networks match what we actually do, moving from a world of cover an area and, and put some good old-fashioned hexagons down, to a three-dimensional world where I'm fundamentally interested in what happens in my home and my office. And if you can fix the experience for me in those places and some important, you know, joining commuting routes and so on, then my, my you know, belief in this being a network that does good things for me is going to go up immeasurably. Uh, and one of the options, by the way, in 3D for the old hexagon is a truncated octahedron. Um, but I'm not seeing that on too many operator uh, logos at the moment. Now, clearly, one of the tools that's helping us match networks to these places 
is the whole role of kind of deconstructing the base station and of reimagining the architecture of the RAN. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. Most of it's you know, very much centered in this world of full CRAN, full you know, Cipriora RI type of splits. And that's a lovely architecture um, if you can find your way to infinite free fiber. And, and in some places, essentially, that's true. So, so I can build as much fiber as I want to into Wembley Stadium and build an absolutely fantastic architecture in those places to deal with the hyper-dense traffic that that represents. But I don't think that's the reality in general in the European context. You know, that, that is not infinite. It is, it is not free. We're going to need a mix of fiber using the legacy copper that's been there for a hundred and something years and, and, you know, and is still useful sometimes and using wireless. And then there's a whole range of other architectural splits that become possible with a different trade-off between cost and performance that we can make use of. So this isn't an argument to say one of these is better, but it's an argument to say when I look across that cityscape, some of these architectures are going to work better in some places than others. And we need all of them in our pockets and, and we need the openness to make the Lego blocks fit together in a consistent fashion. Now, I mentioned that, that you know, one of my particular interests has been in improving the in-building environment, and, and sometimes outdoors in doesn't win. Sometimes you do need to put things inside the building, and the balance between those is a, is a, is a discussion point as to what resources there are and what's economical. In the past, you know, after we'd done the outside in bit and decided that we needed something dedicated, we had very few solutions in our toolbox. If we looked at a building and kind of characterized it in terms of how big it is and how many people there are wanting a service in there, we, we basically had a very thin layer at the edge here of distributed antenna systems. And, and that was an understudied idea. You know, it's basically RF plumbing where we can take a really good base station with all the features that it delivers and just extend its reach through the building. And, and originally that was just big cables and, and antennas, which, by the way, most building an owners absolutely hated. Yeah, you'd turn up to say you'd fix their you were going to fix their wireless problem with a big reel of very thick coax, and they said, you know, I thought this was a wireless system we were installing. What is all this this cabling? And, and you know, you'd be surprised at, at how many times people have been sent back. No, I don't want that in my building. I have cable specifications for my building, and it doesn't include this stuff. You know, it's cat five, it's cat six, it's not this big, thick uh, coax. But gradually, you know, that's evolved and there's an active DAS story there. And then at the other end, we put some Wi-Fi into corner offices and then into homes. And there was this, you know, Martin was talking about gaps in terms of time scales. This is a gap in terms of the buildings that we serve. There were just no solutions in that middle ground. So when a big office building came along and said, can you solve this problem for me? The answer was fundamentally no. We just didn't have a cost-effective answer in the toolkit. Now, you'll notice there are no scales on here, and there's a very good reason there are no scales. Because if you actually look at the number of buildings of different sizes, you know, the sort of floor area inside the building, and the number of people they serve, it's a massively skewed distribution. So between the thousand or so public buildings in the UK, which are really the only places we could cost-effectively deal with with a DAS solution, and the homes that we live in, yeah, we've got at least three orders of magnitude, three going on four orders of magnitude between those. Um, and then 50% of the economy <coughs> sits in between those two in various mid to large scale office buildings and the companies that run their businesses in those environments. And we haven't had a solution for those places. So if I tried to, sorry, if I tried to draw this to scale, you'd see a little tiny pink line around the edge and everything else would be black, basically. So, so, so it's massively underserved in terms of the needs there. Now you'll say, well, actually, we don't need to put solutions into every building. And that's absolutely true. But you know, even if I take a fraction of these, the proportion of them that, that are unserved is, is, is dramatically large. Um, now, small cells have helped with this, and we've evolved this whole range of different species of small cell um, to, to, to deal with different environments, you know, the femtocell world in the domestic, the picocell in the office and enterprise. And then in the outdoor environment, because sometimes outdoors in absolutely does win, 
You can serve a lot of places from a single location outdoors if you get it right. And mostly that debate's been framed in terms of keeping up with capacity. But we found it equally exciting to think about not metro cells, but meadow cells, okay? Getting those fundamentally the same kit into rural locations and bringing the benefits of mobile broadband really cost effectively to those places. People are quite sociable. They don't live uniformly distributed across the countryside. They live in villages and in towns. And you can exploit that high spatial density to deliver something into those locations. Now, with those and a range of other things, what we now have is a toolkit that I'm pleased to say does span the whole range of buildings today. We're very much at the early stages in terms of the rollout of those solutions. Probably less than 2% of office buildings have anything like a, a dedicated indoor wireless uh, solution. And that's not because the other 98% are well served. Uh, you know, let me be clear about that. But between these solutions, there is now scope to cover the, the entire space. Um, what we have now as a challenge, though, is how to choose which solution goes into which location when, how to manage it, how to upgrade it over time, and do that in a way that works beautifully with the existing wide area network, because these all have to orchestrate and play very nicely together in the process. And, and questions emerge all over the place when you think about how this emerging HetNet is really going to work in practice. So, you know, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a credible line of argument that says femto cells in domestic places are, are dead because we've got Wi-Fi calling there or thereabouts, and, you know, and, th and that has a strong role. But actually, we're seeing femto cells volumes bigger than they ever have been before, and the growth is coming from new operators whose only network is some femto cells inside the home. It's not for coverage. It's for a whole different set of reasons. But they're coming in with customers, with networks, with backhaul typically, and finding new ways of cherry picking parts of the mobile network. Now, whether that's a good thing or not depends on your point of view, but it's certainly enabled a business model that wasn't there before. Um, and also, that feeds other sectors, because the ability to manage millions of base stations cost effectively, and to have the chipsets that allow millions of base stations to be built for tens of euro, uh, you know, really changes the options in the other areas. In the urban environment, the metro cells, we're seeing that operators are kind of changing in their thinking. They're going from saying, well, this is a way to get me out of a capacity problem. You know, I'm running out of spectrum or I've got a local hotspot to deal with, to something that actually allows me to sell maybe not quite quality, but at least speed consistently delivered over a wider area. In short, for an operator with a network of densified cells to deliver better to customers more consistently. You know, my network with small cells delivers three times the typical user experience of, a, of another operator without them. Um, but how many of them do you need for that and where? And is that really cost effective? How do you backhaul them or front haul them for that matter? In the enterprise environment, it seems to me there's massive latent demand. And I think there's something that goes to, to some of what, what Misha and others were saying earlier on about, about you know, allowing a B2B model to work more effectively. Actually, these businesses know very well where they've got challenges, where their operations are, where people gather at lunchtime. And an operator coming in to install that on a special coverage basis, yeah, everyone has a special coverage department that goes and does these special buildings, just doesn't scale doesn't remotely scale to these locations. If they can let their customers solve their own problems, but do it in a way that orchestrates nicely with the wide area network, not only that will those customers be happier because they know their exact problem is fixed, but they'll even pay for it. They'll even put their hands in their pockets. And operators have to find ways of working with that, ways of working with their customers on the overall network story, still delivering value, not upsetting the quality of service that they are capable of delivering, but you know, transforming the, the the way that that works. And again, it's you know, let's take the Lego blocks and actually give it to the end customers in the network and allow them to plug them together in an open fashion. In this venue environment, the stadiums and so on, well, the the DAS actually does really good things there. But if ever there was a place where we can do some really good performance enhancing stuff with CRAN, it's in that environment. And it's the the dream use case for so many network technologies, for mobile edge computing, for caching, and so on. Um, you know, and I'm uh, delighted if we can find ways to, to help in these environments. And, 
and up then back to architecture, we are actually working alongside architects now, finally not just on building friendly wireless, but actually on wireless friendly buildings, yeah, on designing from the beginning what we need to do physically in the building that for the long term this building is going to be uh, you know, meeting the, the needs of the people in there. Um, and then lastly, in rural, we've actually mapped the entire world. I mean, we, we did spend a lot on, on a bunch of you know, Google compute resources, actually, to try and take the entire world and where the population lives and, and map out how many cells of various sizes you need to serve that population. It took a long time, and we actually ran out of money because we spent too much. I'm sure we could get the parallel computing better in that. Um, but but what, what we came out with is, is you can spend the same amount of money that you would spend on a traditional network rollout strategy and serve about half a billion people that just wouldn't have been served otherwise with the same amount of money. And if you translate that into social benefit, it's of order a trillion dollars. Uh, yeah, and there's a real opportunity there to, to, to fix geography. So some of the other things that are happening in architecture do point towards 5G, and I'm very pleased to be working with a number of the people in this room on this, this new project, 5G Norma, under the Horizon 2020 environment. I'm not going to go into details about exactly what's going on in that environment, but, but it, it covers network evolution in both the edge and in the core, and does that in a multi-service, multi-tenanted, capable fashion, um, and figures out from that what the balance is and, and how much flexibility we need. Now, now you know, I'll let others in the project talk to you about, about the, you know, the clever technology in there. Our role in there is actually figuring out what good that is for, for the society and for the economics around that. Actually working out for a number of these different environments I've been talking about, how we can use this new architecture to paint pictures that actually fit better than they have done in the past. And here's the challenge. I can't go to the users today and have them explain to me what value they get from 5G, because they simply don't know. Yeah, we have, to, we have to be more subtle than that about understanding the value that could come over time. And we definitely have to be agile, because they'll put the Lego blocks together in a way that's different to the one we expect today. Um, and, and, you know, and over the next few years, I think there's a very exciting journey to work on there. So Kings was one of the last ones I put up there. Sorry, Misha, I should have put it straight up there. So just to bring this to life, one of the things that we've been trying to do is actually not just talk in a, in a, in a fuzzy way about matching architectures to demand, but actually put some numbers to this. And, and by way of example, we were confronted by a regulator saying, we've heard that you've got Wi-Fi offload and small cells and, and you know, clever LTE and 5G technology coming, so we don't think you need as much spectrum into the industry. Surely that's the solution to all these capacity challenges. Well, we, we mapped out some demand and how it might vary over time. We looked at you know, this, this sort of tripod of different sources of capacity, more spectrum bands, more technology, a range of different architectures and cell types. And to every one of those possible increments on capacity, we put some costs. We worked out what it would take to add this capacity. And we compared all of the possibilities in terms of its cost effectiveness in meeting the evolving demand. And out of that, we could figure out what the costs were. And we could take things away. We could deny spectrum and see how much the costs increased as a result of that. And let me see if I can uh, show you this working. I'll run it and uh, perhaps good things will happen. Oh, I wasn't expecting the music, but as the, the minute waltz progresses, um, what you see here is demand. And in each year for 18 years, you see the excess demand pop up that the network can't serve. We've got some interesting compatibility issues between the usual Microsoft and Apple story. So we have to go back to the minute. Um, and what happens is the network gets built to match that demand in the first year, and that matches against existing networks in this environment. And up here, we have spectrum bands that are being used. The regulators are auctioning them, operators are getting to them. They're starting to become more and more heavily utilized until there comes a point where that's so heavily utilized that probably Delta Q reaches a big value or something, uh, and it becomes rational to start to use other solutions. And what happens is we build out a network. These are macro cells of various sorts. These are some outdoor cells. Behind the scenes, there's a lot of cells going into buildings as well. And down here, we end up with the costs that come as a result of watching that evolution happen. So basically what you end up with is 
the most cost efficient network that you could possibly have given the inputs, the technology inputs that are there to meet the demand. And we can run this many times and find out what happens with and without spectrum, with and without indoor small cells, with and without you know, uh, higher order MIMO, for example, and see the impact. And what we found over many, many cases is there is a period in the early 2020s where the pips really squeak, where, where the, you know, the balance of demand to the supply of capacity relative to the cost is looking really difficult, is looking really challenging. Now, I'm sure that the innovation represented by the intellect in this room will work really hard to avoid that happening. But for example, we were able to show the regulator who was thinking about 700 megahertz at the time, which is a very thin slice of spectrum compared to the total amount of demand. And it was making them think, actually, you know, is it really material? Can't we, shouldn't we leave it with these broadcasters? And what we see here in this middle part, you know, here's time around the early 2020s, rats. Um, uh, and what we find is that if that small amount of spectrum is made available just too late, you hit a crunch and costs increase very rapidly. And we have a significant advantage in cost terms from bringing 700 megahertz into the equation just in advance of that crunch that would otherwise happen. And actually to amplify the message from earlier on, when we dug really deeply to find out where that is, is because 700 megahertz, in fact, in the small cell layer, surprisingly, was reaching that indoor demand very much more cost effectively than, than other solutions at that time. So in fact, there was a lovely synergy between the new architectures and the new spectrum. So we were able to explain to them it's not spectrum or architecture or densification, it's absolutely both. You really need both if you want the synergies between them. So the last bit I just wanted to mention is, is we're also working uh, now with a bunch of partners on, on a project for the Commission on the socio-economic basis for strategic planning of 5G in the European context. And I don't know how that's going to go. We haven't kicked off the project yet. But in, in short, it's the business case for the introduction of 5G in Europe, not for an individual operator or individual user, but for Europe as a whole. And we've got a really hard job ahead of us figuring out where those benefits come from in industries that don't even know they need 5G yet. So your thoughts in that area will be uh, great, gratefully received. So I in short, my, my, my sort of outcome is I think if you want modern styles of usage, in your network, you need modern architectures. Those architectures in technical terms need to be essentially as diverse or configurable to be as diverse as the places and the people that use those networks. We therefore need a toolkit where we can engineer those architectures into those places. We're on a, a long-term mission to make the, you know, the wireless architecture sit alongside the physical architecture of the building and be an important consideration in all the new buildings that are, that are built. In order to manage that, it's going to be very hard. It's very complex. We need the tools and metrics that Martin was talking about. We need a whole range of different products and solutions there. But actually, I'd like to make a case that we also need the users to help us with this job. We need them to help us fashion the networks in their image in a way that they've hardly been able to do in the past. And if you do that, they can meet their needs. They can take responsibility for some of the provision. And they can pay for some of it. And that helps everybody. And in doing that, we need to not look for the best architecture or the best solution, but find rational ways of, of selecting from amongst the alternatives. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> uh, fascinating, really, to look a little bit in the future, like 15, 20 years. It's amazing your tool you developed there, an enormous value. So I presume there must be questions to Simon here. Uh, keep shooting. Jens. I uh, had the opportunity to have um, discussing with Simon yesterday at uh, dinner and we make him bring up this question again. I mean, um, you talk about real architectures and uh, um, we had discussing the, the concept of wireless friendly architectures and we had a d uh, disagreement on what was wireless friendly. I think that sh every house should be metal sheeted so we can uh, use the same spectrum everywhere so I don't get interfered by my neighbor. And also, I mean, I think also think the concept of bringing 700 megahertz as for for indoor use. It's it's. Uh, uh, I mean, th if that would be the, the the purpose, then our houses would be glass all over, so we can have the street lights lighting the house uh, inside. That would be the cost efficient solution. But actually, we we don't have glass everywhere. We actually 
don't try to disturb our neighbor with the, with what we are doing inside our building. So uh, we, we like privacy. So yeah. um, so um, um, do you have a comment on that? I mean, on, on, on the future of that? I mean, I think it, it of course, it must be more cost efficient and energy efficient to, to run from the inside and not from outside. It in. is. I, I mean, in practice, you need, you need some, some of both. What, what you've just said reminds me of my, my kind of first radio wave planning job where I was engineering fixed links and there were some trees inconveniently in the way and I couldn't quite work out how to engineer around them. So, I, you know, I proposed to my boss that we cut down the trees, you know, and that was a very, you know, it, we're engineers, we're supposed to make the technology fit the world around us rather than the reverse. So you know, having said that, there, you know, there is a, a genuine long-term project here that, that, that buildings, the built environment, thinks about not only light and heat and power, but does think about connectivity from the beginning. We're at the very early stages of that journey. It's, you know, it's a very cost-sensitive environment, and technology changes much faster than the built architecture does, the built environment, so aligning those is really hard. But you know, certainly the property industry is now treating this as something that matters. You know, they have tenants that leave in droves if they don't get it right. What I want to caution against, though, is the idea that that leads us to putting in an architecture in these buildings that is all operators for all time, for free access, and somehow coming up with, well, because maybe the industry isn't completely delivering today, we should go to a fully nationalized architecture, and that the competition in the in the network is is dead. I think I think there are middle ways there that are both cost efficient, but but you know leave some scope for operators to be different amongst each other. Mm. Any other questions? I have uh, I have actually a question on the on the market opportunity. So you mentioned the rural a trillion dollars. Um, what is that like? The UK, the globe per year? And yeah, that's that's global, and that's a, a present value of the opportunity to deliver uh, mobile broadband benefits. Right to underserved populations around the world that don't necessarily have no coverage, but have lagging right. coverage and service levels. Um, and it's all about you know, targeting mm. the, the right architecture mm. to the right places. Mm -hmm. So there's places where, actually rural mm. island, I figured out that the best thing to do is put a lot more macrocells there, because right. everyone's distributed in farms. Mm -hmm. yeah? and, and if people are uniformly distributed, macrocells are the most cost effective thing you can right. do. Okay. If people are in tiny villages, you can put something in the middle of that tiny mm -hmm. village that serves everybody very nicely and is massively more cost right. effective. Was satellite? Did you did you find? You can use some satellite backhaul does yeah. actually help. I mean, yeah. there are some great satellite optimized mm -hmm. solutions for mm -hmm. that, but not only. I mean, it's a very you know horses for courses situation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much, Simon. Great. Great, great. stuff. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>